They play with so much intensity, like very quietly. And also, I feel like that you play like a. Feels to me that like you play in phrases, and that there's like a lot of interior like dynamics to all your phrases. So like, you'll hit something, and it'll just be like it'll super pop out because there's a lot of control with the rest of the stuff. And I wonder if you like specifically work on that, or that's just something that you just have. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> definitely a process of uh, playing in a lot of different environments. You know, aside from the practice, and I was trying to do it home. You know, like how do I like fill that press roll? You know, that kind of uh, momentum. But but I like you say within within a phrase, within a beat, all this other information uh, in the undercurrent. So a lot of it came from, from uh, playing with George French and Emile Vanette at the yeah. Sheraton um, six nights a week. <laughs> they could make music from it, no matter what the request. Uh, can you play Blueberry Hill? Sure. You know, can you play uh, String Notation? Yeah, no problem. It didn't matter. Anybody who asked for anything. And it taught me a lot because I didn't have a lot of respect for that, that gig when I was doing it. You know, I'm at the Sheraton thinking I wanted to be at Snug Harbor, playing with Mr. Marsalis, you know. But I need to be at, at Sheraton, <laughs> but, you know, and, and it taught me such a great lesson of, of uh, how to make music, you know, within, no matter what the song was, hopefully, you know. And, and those inner dynamics came from night after night of hitting and missing, you know, a, a lot about the missing. But, uh, you know. I, I know Herlin talks a lot about that. Just, just try to enjoy whatever situation you're in. You know, sometimes we get in these gigs that we, you know, may not want to be doing. But, <laughs> but you know, he, his attitude is, well, there's a lesson in this somewhere. You know, yeah. let me, let me see. You know, if, if only just to try to keep my, uh, <laughs> yeah. my sensibility straight. That's a lesson in itself, or whatever. But uh, that's a good, that's a good attitude. Just to really uh, edit, try to play as much as you possibly can, yeah. and you know, try to enjoy every situation. And the listening too, I remember um, Jeff Boudreau, he was another, he had studied with Johnny before me and in the way he was like my uh, teacher as well because he'd always give me advice when I'd see him and he'd uh, call me to sub for him from time to time. But uh, Jeff Boudreau was like, man, you know, you gotta go to the music library and check this out. You gotta, you know, there's this great Prokofi, you know, there's this Ravel, you need to, you know, I'm like, okay, you know. That's why I would, and I go to the music library, and, and I think that helped a lot, having, having the exposure, uh, you know, the, so you don't narrow your vision uh, to, to, uh, to the possibilities, you know, because there's a lot of ways to, to, to make a groove happen with people, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be one way, so um, I don't know, I hope that makes sense. You have a question? Uh, I have a question for you and Mr. Coward. Yeah. Um, I would like to know what are some albums that have really personally meant a lot to y'all and so y'all always go back to them you know, to always keep the one to play the music that y'all play. Yeah, I mean like, you know, Miles Davis, My Funny Valentine, like that era with Herbie, Ron, Tony, Wayne, or that was George Coleman, I guess, but you know. That, that band as a whole, the Coltrane group, Impulse Records, like 60, what is that, 63 or 60, yeah. just 67. Yeah. Uh, we, I remember Brian uh, would always be listening to records in <laughs> the music library in Mahoney's office or whatever. Come check this out. You know, <laughs> Kenny Wheeler, New High record was like a big one for me because Keith Jarrett and Dave Holland, Dijonet and uh, Kenny Wheeler and his writing. You guys used to play some of Kenny's tunes too. I mean, yeah, kayak, yeah, kayak, yeah, yeah. 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 Just great tunes yeah. and incredible playing. Yeah, we recorded that. Actually, that was on that, was, that, was on that record. Too. Yeah, so, forgot. <laughs> <laughs> wow, for me, um, I guess uh, it's weird. I've been thinking about you know my time when I met John and then Steve back in 88, and there was this DJ at WWOZ named Blue Lou. And she gave me a cassette of, uh, of all these musicians I'd never heard of. Sunhouse, Brian Willie Johnson, uh, all this music from the Georgia Sea Islands. 
And I think, I think if it all came down to it, I would trade my whole collection for that cassette. Mm -hmm. That cassette changed the course for me in a lot of ways. I mean, of course, I had to, you know, I love Supreme. Art Blakey's uh, Indestructible. Um, I mean, the, I, within this this way of improvising that we play, those records are ultimately important to me. But when I listen to Blind Willie play by himself, you know, and it's 1928, and he's on Canal Street and Word Lines, I think. <laughs> it, there's nothing that can touch it because he's transmitting something that that's what I want to get to at the drums. That, that thing that cuts through technology and cuts through um, uh, selling anything or, you know, it's just, he transmits something that's, that's, tr that's real to him. And, uh, so, anyway, I gotta, I'll write down the name of all the songs on that cassette, you know. I got that cassette. I hope you, I hope you transfer. <laughs> yeah, to, to a, keep, a later yeah, date, yeah. like maybe eight tracks. I'll try. Like I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, Nick's yeah, I, have, I have a question. Um, you mentioned Rebel. Uh, do you listen to a lot of classical music? And how has it helped you play like in the um, you know, improvisational music? Or like, how has it helped you just as far as like being able to play with other musicians? Um, I, I do try and listen to a lot of orchestral music. Um, you know, I just discovered this these Estonian, this Arvo Pier, uh I think his name is, I hope I'm not mispronouncing it. I like uh, listening to the radio, you know, and man, it really inspired me. I gotta find this recording that I, that I heard, but Say, I remember Jeff Boudreaux telling me about, you know, Igor Stravinsky and Rite of Spring, and like, okay, I should listen to that. And that piece, actually, that's one of the records that that's really important to me because I think it speaks a lot to the way John writes and the way I write. Not not so directly, but the way it unfolds from just a seed and becomes this like monstrosity of nature, you know, just like crashing and you know, destruction, but but it's beautiful too. So I think it, it it does impact the way I I like to shape forms. Um, a lot of you know I, I've had conflicts with people who play who I've been playing with, and they're like, you know, keep the time going. I'm like. Isn't the time going anywhere? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like a, so. You know, for me, the harmonic motion. I mean, okay, the rhythmic motion is ultimately important too. But you know, you don't always have to drive that into the ground. I mean, you want a groove, obviously. You, you know, if people are dancing, you're not going to leave backbeats out on them. <laughs> but, but I'm saying, but you have to understand. You know, you have to know your your situation and 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 know and your liberty. You know, and hopefully, you know, feel like you're serving a song at all times. That you never, you know, uh, uh, imposing something on on music. You're letting the music. I think your use of dynamics too, to me, is very orchestral. Well, that's I mean, it was, yeah. You know, I mean, that's it's you, you sound like you're just painting colors to me. You know, sometimes you know, and it seems to me that that must have been influenced maybe by orchestral music. Absolutely, it's kind of like um, yeah, New York, New York Philharmonic, Leonard Bernstein conducting, you know, Pirate, and Art Blakey. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these are their dynamic forces, you know, and uh, so you know, you try and find find all that shape and and uh, motion in your instrument. So um, it's always humbling, you know. I, every time, you know, every time you listen to those records. And you listen to yourself back, you know. You think, oh, but you, but you, what can we do? We gotta just keep, keep playing, you know, keep trying. Um, yeah, what? <laughs> um, if you could please um, um, talk about a little bit more about you, you and John, about your writing for the fellowship band, and all those songs with those great forms, and 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 the jazz waltzes. Some of my favorites in there are jazz waltzes. Okay. If you could just talk more about <laughs> Well, John, John um, inspired me. You know, as I said, when I met 
he was already writing. I think Perceptual was even written back then. You know, it took us a decade uh, later to, no, even more, almost more than a decade to actually record it on you know, the record, but it existed for a long time. So I think that song and John, you know, it inspired me to 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 want to write and to have him to write for. It. I knew I was safe, so to speak. You know, like, he's gonna make it right. You know, even if it's <laughs> if it's not right, he's gonna make it right. And uh, and to have Myron and Melvin, and Chris, you know, to know you write for it. it. A lot. I think a lot of it uh, is not unlike Duke Ellington and his orchestra. I think he, he took a lot of pride and uh, a good pride in, in, in knowing that, that Johnny Hodges was going to carry this melody or that Paul and Bob was going to be playing the melody. It, it, it adds a weight, I think, to the note as it's going down on the paper. When you're thinking about these people, They're, I mean, anyone can play it maybe, but you have a uh, charge with, you know, with these people. Um, yeah, it's 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 kind of deep, and I got spoiled early. <laughs> Having Brian play my tunes, because then I moved to New York, I think before maybe a couple of years before you did. Yeah, I was up there like handing out charts to guys. I'm like, oh, this not doesn't sound like. Ooh, that music. Your heart, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's it's really important, and and it's inspiring to know who your guys are in your band, or people are in your band, and, and try to write for that and. Uh, but I think you were talking about classical music. That, that's that been a big influence on me. My story is kind of backwards as, as far as most musicians go, I think, because I was a French horn player that came to New Orleans to study classical music. I played a little piano and then got here and had never really heard jazz and heard these guys and had peers like Brian and Matt Limler and Mark Mullins and just was just got bitten <laughs> by the yeah. jazz bug or whatever. <laughs> I mean, in terms of uh, composition, when you when you guys write a new composition, do you do you do you specifically write for a recording session, or do you or do you let the composition evolve before you go into the studio? Because I, no I noticed this with the Astro Project that we we sort of like now we realize after a couple of times of doing this that we let the tunes we record tunes and they evolve. After so, we play them, you know, we, well, we should we should let the tunes evolve first before we record right. them. But I was just wondering if you have any particular philosophy on that. We've done both. I think the first record we'd played one gig. Yeah. As as a band, yeah. you know, obviously we played for years, but then we toured some, and then went in the studio, did the second record, and I felt like everything had evolved. You know, the band had evolved, and there were new tunes. Some of them we hadn't played, and then after the recording, they started going different directions. Yeah. Cricket Creek is like that. That's true. It's great to be in that process and to have a little time where you're not rushed to, to do a little experimenting right. and try a direction. Because like a, like John was saying on on perceptual, those those were new songs, so we were still finding our way through them. So I I kind of have a mixed feeling about knowing the songs too well sometimes. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's, 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 it's one of those fine lines, I right, think, of right, like, right. Uh, ha having that first take and refreshing uh, interpretation where you like, yeah. you, you wish you could kind of get back to it, yeah. but to also know that you're not right. stumbling, you know, over the thing to make it, to make it whole and real. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, during that record, we were, we were discovering a lot of, of how to, how to make make them records, you know, and and, and they were going to do what they were going to do live, obviously. But I know Myron was soloing on something, and I don't know. We might have played too many choruses. <laughs> we're like, how many choruses? Are there? About a hundred. And we knew something. We thought, okay, right. let's try to get something. It's like, yeah, let's alter the form here. Let's go back to. So I like to take those chances in the studio, and mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and when you have people you trust, yeah. You can you can do that because everybody want, wants the best result. All right. Well, look, we 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 probably should wrap it up. Would you like to wrap it up with another song, maybe? Or are you? Are you? We could at least play the the melody of Stephen's song. Oh, Stephen's song. Is that what you want to do? I, I, I was going to ask you if you wanted to do something New Orleans like, like, but okay. I feel like you know, <laughs> something about New Orleans and 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 um, that way of playing. I feel like 
it comes into our writing in a subtle way when I don't even realize it. Like right. time moves past and I can't. Right, right, right. I listen to something like Patron Saint a Girl, and I'm like, man, that is so mm. second line. <laughs> <laughs> it's so slow, but but it's so New Orleans. So I don't know. I try, it, it's in everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. I haven't noticed in a long time, so I'm like, I'm man. If you played this before, <laughs> I think I there's did. a lot of notes in yeah, here. Yeah. I, I'll be really impressed if you can read this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
All right, well, again, you know, one of the great things about uh, New Orleans and Jazz Festival time is uh, we got all these great musicians coming through town. You know, we had Peter Bernstein the other day, and now uh, we're very honored to have, like, one of the greatest drummers, I think, in the world, um, one of the best drums I've ever played with. Um, he actually did a record with me many, many years ago, you know, before he was a big and famous cool. star. You know? <laughs> he was cheap at that time. <laughs> I could afford him at that time, you know. And uh, just a great cat, and um, he's, he's going to do whatever he wants, and he said he wanted to play. So we're going to play, and then uh, I'm sure we can coax some uh, question and answer out of him or, or at some point. But anyway, how about a big round of applause for Brian Blue? Cell phone. You know, and, and actually, a great inspiration for myself and John Coward. Um, John, we met in 1988 at Loyola, and he was already composing. And I think a lot of a lot of his inspiration came from from Steve, um, as it still does. And. Uh, Play. Yeah, let's play. Let's play. Uh, I was real honored that John told me he played this tune on his recital. This is actually a tune that uh, Brian asked me to um, if we could play this today, and, and we recorded it on a Blue Note record many years ago called Direct Access. This is called Ascending Reverence.
You don't have to say anything else. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Well, I mean, I got a question. Man, just like, how did man, you seem like you just like you can read people's minds? Man. Just like, I mean, just uh, how, I mean, uh, yeah, how do you how, how do you think? <laughs> I, I, you know, again, I have to you know um, think back to the times when we used to see you all the time, and uh, getting to see John Vidakovich play, and. Uh, you know, knowing that, okay, he had not necessarily assigned me, but pointed me in the direction of certain recordings. It's like, you know you need to listen to Elvin. You know you need to listen to Art Blake. You know you need to listen to Pop Joe Jones. <coughs> you know you need to listen to Pop um, So, anyway, but to see him <laughs> and the way he interpret, interpreted any piece of music and incorporated his own vision in, into, the, into the thread of of, uh, of a structure, mm -hmm. it, it 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 just helped me to kind of hopefully find my own way. Yeah. Uh, I know I know John. I mean, one one thing about Johnny is he won't play on a tune unless he really knows the form of the tune. Huh? You know I mean? And I know sometimes that's an issue with drummers. Sometimes it's like maybe like you know just keep their you know, timekeeping is their is their function, but you know, he really, he, he has to map it out no matter if it's, it's symmetrical or asymmetrical or whatever, he has to really know the form of the tune. Yeah. How do you go about learning a new tune? Like when you uh, I don't know, confront I, it with something new that you haven't played before, do you, do you, how, long does it take, how, long, how long does it take before you feel like you're comfortable, like I can really make something with this tune? A lot of times those first, in your first go round is the one. Because uh, in a way you're you're forced to listen. You know, if you're not reading something, even even that, you know, you can look. But if you're not really tuned into what what's happening around around you, you're, you're sort of just going to tumble through it, and, and and it'll come around again, and you might <laughs> you might get a second chance, but but you may not. So I always try and just try and be. Um, as much in the moment as I can, even if that moment wants me to leave space, even if that moment, uh, you know, requires uh, a certain energy, I think it's it, it's good to have your time feel in your body so that you can let let those those moments happen. You can take those chances and and let Martin dictate a move or let John, you know, let let the group have uh, a connection. So that you're not uh, imposing anything on it, but you're just surrendering to the thing. So I, that, at least that's what I, I always got from my favorite musicians: uh, the, the integrated quality of their uh, of their ability. Yeah. yeah, it seems like great great musicians just sort of transcend their instrument. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you, I mean, you would be great no matter what you play. <laughs> I don't know, but the you want to play the guitar? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I, if anybody has any thoughts. I mean, the thing that John and I had immediately, which I never take for granted, is this um, sympathetical, you know, this understanding of, of, of how to communicate without having any words necessarily. Just to sit and play together. That's immeasurable, to have that one other person that you have reflection with and that you can uh, ground your time feel with. I say time feel because you know we all spend our time alone you know, with metronomes and all that. That's all good, but until you get it in the context, it, it won't. It won't really, you know, take action. It won't take root in you. So. Play at hotels six nights a week. <laughs> you know, those are the things that take you to the next level. You know, as much experience as you can have with your instrument daily you know, in any situation, I would say. John, do you, what's your, what's your sense of like, just the interpretation of, like, like playing this piece of music, obviously we played it, when was it, 80, no, no, 91. The recital was like 89 or 90. Oh my god. So, <laughs> you don't look that old. <laughs> so, so it's great that, you know, once 
and not that you don't lose things as you go along the trip, but you know, we it's still in yeah, there since eighty nine, mm -hmm. you know, this piece of music like it's, it's yeah. like, that speaks to I, speaks I'm, to I'm glad you I'm glad you called it. <laughs> and play since the last time I played with Brian. Oh, man. <laughs> the time we used to play together, I, I don't know, for me it was so formative. And do you have a sense of like what it helped us with or didn't help us with? Well, I mean, we played duo a lot yeah. because bass players were working all day. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Bass players always had the gigs. So we, we ended up in the band room yeah. trying out stuff. and. I don't know, just listen, you know, listening to stuff too. Yeah. Like same records. Check this out. Yeah. We were always sharing things with each other. Yeah. Like I say, I feel like just um, just having that one other person mm -hmm. to, to interact with. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody have a question for Brian before well, we're gonna play a lot of music if, if if unless you have something to ask specifically. I know anyone says some drums, yeah. I know you got a question. <laughs> Can you talk about your time? You know, coming up here, going on to school, and then going on into the world. Um, well, Just I'm from Shreveport. Uh, yeah, Shreveport, Louisiana. So I, I um, started at Loyola in 1988. Moved here. Um, so when when did you want to go? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like after two years at Loyola, um, I transferred here to you <coughs> know. Studying with Mr. Marsalis, and later he invited me to be a part of his, his trio, like Darren and uh, Chris Thomas and myself. So, and Mr. Marsalis is, you know, he's such a deep teacher, and in, in 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 the sense of what he doesn't say or what he doesn't really tell you, he his example is going to be what he has for you most time. I mean, he'll he'll shed a light on when when you're going off the path. You know, say, oh, you know. <laughs> So let's, let's let's take it, you know, being back. But but he's, you know, it's it's what he's what he's telling you with his instrument. And so anyway, I, I had to preface coming to Loyola by having to come to one of the jazz fest at Loyola um, previous year before I, before I graduated. JJ Johnson had come to be the guest artist, and that's what, I think the first time I heard John Dockfish, and not really knowing it. It kind of sealed my decision. It was like, okay, I need to go there. I'm not sure why, but so mm -hmm. thankfully, I, I, you know, I didn't have to ask a lot of questions then. You know, like I am now. Where am I going? What do I do? <laughs> you know, you get a little older, you start to put responsibilities. So I remember, take. I remember the first time I heard you play, man. It was in a com I was teaching a combo at Loyola before way before you were Yeah. And you were really young. You remember the I kind of heard a little things about you or something, and, and we. You played, sat in a combo, and, and I said, and you just start sitting there with people. Uh, <laughs> that, that was the privilege, too, because these guys let you in on it. They didn't, you know, I mean, it, it, even if you were, you know, kind of sad, you know, you, you, you kind of like, you know, you're working it out. But they gave me the chance, you know, and, and uh, seeing David Lee Jr. and Ernie Kelly, um, you know, Shannon Powell from Diamond Time, Herlin Riley, you know, it was just like, we, we tried to take it in as much as we could. Columns Hotel. Yeah. <laughs> National Project, of course. But, so I don't know, I, I hope I'm answering your question. Being, being in New Orleans. Uh, can you talk about your progression moving out of New Orleans too? Oh, well, um, I guess it really, it started with Mr. Marsalis and, and, and also having met uh, Kenny Garrett, the, one, of the, one of the first times I went to New York. You moved to New York after New Orleans, right? I did. I never thought I would leave, and I, I still have my regrets, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you think about going back? <laughs> I don't know, man. You know, I, just, I feel as if um, everything that I was doing here, experiencing, taking in, was preparing me to, you know, to do everything else. Just, just as my my upbringing in Shreveport had done that, you know, and my you know, playing, starting to play drums in church. That taught me an immeasurable uh, lesson in the bedrock of it all. It's just, are you, you know, are you listening? What are they saying? You know, what's being said? Oh, I'm sorry. Who's, who's calling? He's, man, he's so iPhone. Calling. Calling. I think so, like, <laughs> imagine know. what it's doing to my brain. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, especially uh, playing with a lot of singers, 
in church that, you know, they aren't musicians, they're people that are just, they're praising. So, they, you know, maybe they didn't go to the fourth chord. And you don't go unless they go. <laughs> and it's beautiful to, to be able to just stay there and say it's okay. You know, we're still moving. Yeah, anyway, um, I'm going off the track, but I, I was playing a lot with Delphi on Marsalis when I was here. And he was, he, he, he was, he's such a funny dude because he was tyrannical on the drummers, you know. I was talking to Darian about it the other day. <laughs> you know, he wanted to hear a certain thing and it was challenging us. Victor Atkins knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, it, but, but it, 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 uh, it, it helped to have those challenges, you know, to, to try and fit into ensembles and, and, and know what, what you had to bring truly. Like, because you can't, you can't bring something that you don't have, but that's someone else's. You have to give it the years you have to. So, anyway, I don't know. That's, I, I met, uh, I met Josh Rebevin during that time. We were all playing together, and uh, a lot of times, sometimes, I should say, people ask, how did you know you get into that situation? And say, I mean, it was, you know, I can't, I can't really say aside from it was a blessing to be able to do it and to to, to know that I, I never really had to uh, try and network as much as I needed to be there and listen. Hopefully, you know, you know one, one thing I, I, need to, I need to say about Brian too, and I, you know, I've just observed that and, you know he's been one of the most successful sidemen. Of course, he's a great leader of his own group, but there's so many people that want to play with him, and I think it's above, above and beyond his ability to play the, the instrument. You know, it's just his personality. You know, he's just such a warm, glowing, friendly person. You know, I've never heard. I tell the other say, so nice, man. Don't you ever like go off on it? Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see that. Like, just like go off on the waiter or something like that. Just like, oh, just a drink or something, you know? <laughs> maybe, maybe he holds it all inside. But um, I felt that the same way about Marvin Smith. Smith. He's, yeah. He was always, he was, he always started to turn up on records or stuff like that. When I found him, he's, he's just the nicest guy in the world. You know what I mean? And I think that that's a that's a lesson in itself. Is you, you can't, especially the side man, you can't come to a, a playing situation or, or a gig and have an attitude. You know what I mean? You just have to be, you know, because it, it's it's a social thing. You know, we all have to feel comfortable with each other. You know, and we have to kind of leave our egos at the door. You know what I mean? And I think that that's, I mean, that's just part of nat his natural. Uh, he didn't have to work at that. That's just the way he is. You know. But I think that that wouldn't. Do you ever attribute a little bit of your success to, to your your personality, or just have you been in situations where you feel like you it was like oil and water with anybody or, or people it, where it didn't work very it's well. happened once or twice yeah, yeah. It, but it's important to you know uh, people say you know some folks say you can't trust your feelings and all that, but people want to know that you want to be there you know and they right. want to know that you're emotionally invested that you yeah. that you got uh, you know just that desire to right to make it happen to, to, to you know like by by you being a part of it right. to, 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 to give that thing that that then all of a sudden it just lifts it up. So, I mean, I feel like... And that's always where the, the, the business and the pleasure kind of like, you know, that's, 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 yeah. uh, it's, you know, because you know, you're probably playing anyway, but it's like, you know, this is I'm, so I'm glad you're doing this for free today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm glad that you share the time with y'all, you know, and, and that John and I, we, we got a couple days ago, we've been in the streets, but the fact that we could just, um, you know, you know, I had this little moment, you know, first time we played with Martin, and it's great to, to have that unspoken connection with someone, you know, where, you know, you're not looking at each other like, oh, are we hooking up, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully, you know, I mean, sometimes it's going to happen, and then, you know, you have to know, are you going to give, you know, are you going to meet each other in the middle, you know, that's important, you know, if, if you're not going to, oh. Uh, I know I turned it off. Now. It, it might be. Maybe, maybe it's fine. Maybe, sure. maybe it's fine. <laughs> Sorry, folks. This is the evils of. Yeah. That's funny you say because I the first time I ever played with Johnny Vidakovich. I'm off. You off? Right. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's built into my amp. That's something. okay. I paid extra for that. I got, I got a wireless uh, amp. But uh, the first time I played with Johnny Vidakovich, you know, I heard heard a lot about him, and, and you know, uh, yeah, I got this reputation that preceded him and stuff like that. But we. We were just doing like a little trio gig. Somehow the band leader I was 
uh, with hire Johnny. Johnny did the gig. You know, it was, a, it was at Ford, so it used to be right around the block from uh, a little tiny place right around the block from uh, Tipitina's, you know. Okay. And he did about two or three gigs, and I swear, I ne he never said a word. He never said anything. And it was like, I, I never had any verbal contact with him at all. He just came, played the gig, played great. And for three or four gigs, you know what I mean? It's like, I never had any kind of like conversation with the guy. And it was like, on a way, it was just like really cool because the conversation didn't taint like anybody's, you know, like pre preconceptions about the way it would be or whatever. He just came and did the gig. And, you know. okay. I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe, maybe he hated the gig. <laughs> well, when did National Project come together? Oh, well, that's, yeah. Well, I'm the junior member. I'm, 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 I've only been with the band 25 years. Oh, no. <laughs> the band's been together. We had our 30-year anniversary last year. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's been a while. We're the Rolling Stones of jazz. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a measurable. That. Speaking of Astro Project, you feel like doing an Astro Project tune, man? Or even North one? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a kind of a... I don't want, want you to sight read that one over there, but that's a kind of, you know... Unless, unless you want to. <laughs>